This is from the Gospel of Luke, first chapter, beginning with the 26th verse. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month, for the word of God will never fail. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea, to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leapt within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. Mary responded, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord. How my spirit rejoices in God, in God my Savior. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl. And from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things for me. Welcome to the first Sunday of Advent, this preparation time for Christmas. So um, Pastor Jeff had some things going on this week and so asked me to, to do the message. And so here I am. So I was cleaning out a storage room the other day, not in my house, and I found this. I think we all know that this is an angel, right? Yeah. And it got me thinking, do you think this is what angels really look like? I don't think so either. I mean, I mean, it looks like a perfect Hallmark angel, a perfect Christmas card angel, but I'm not so sure that this is what angels really look like. I mean, in 2 Kings, it talks about the angel of the Lord in defending the holy city of Jerusalem, goes through the Assyrian camp and slaughters 185,000 soldiers in one night. Uh, that's not that angel, right? That's not a Hallmark angel. That's like Terminator angel, right? 14 feet tall with a 10-foot sword and like six wings. And, you know, that's something out of Revelation. So, so you look through the Bible and angels show up, you know, every now and then. And almost every time an angel shows up, people have two reactions. Number one is, they're terrified, right? I mean, the shepherds in the field, right? The angel shows up, and what did it say? They were so sore afraid, right? I mean, they were terrified. The soldiers that are guarding Jesus' tomb after the crucifixion, the angel shows up, and they fall to the ground as if dead men. That's what it says, right? Daniel was was in captivity with the Jews and Gabriel showed up and he was terrified and fainted to the ground, unable to stand. So, I don't know what angels, maybe there's pretty angels like this one up in heaven and maybe there's Terminator angels and maybe there's all kinds of different angels, but, but I don't think they all look like that. So after the people get over the terror of the angel, their next reaction is what? They argue. 
They say, no, can't be, right? Now, I don't know exactly what the burning bush looked like. The, the scripture says that the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a burning bush. So I don't know if he could see the form of an angel or what, but God comes with this message of Moses that the start of the great story of the delivery of the people is going to start with you. And Moses says, um, who am I to go to Pharaoh, right? And when God answers that question, then he says, well, who do I say sent me? I don't even know your name. And so God answers that question. He says, well, what if they don't believe me? And God says, they will. And then he says, look, I'm not a good public speaker. My t- I get tongue-tied. Please send someone else, right? This is Moses, right? The founder, or not the founder, but he's like, you know, all the Jews in Jesus' day, they're like, we're the sons of Moses. Well, look at Moses. Really? You're bragging about that? <laughs> An angel shows up to Gideon at uh, one time in the Old Testament. The, um, the Hebrews are, are being um, overrun by the Midianites. And in Judges 6, Gideon is hiding in a cellar threshing out grain because the Midians have been coming and taking all the food. And Judges 6 says, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, O mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this stuff happened to us? Where are the wonders that our ancestors told us about? The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel. Am I not sending you? Which is a way of sending, I'm sending you, right? (laughs) Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in the tribe, and I'm the least in that family. And the Lord answers, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. So, you know, an angel shows up, and first we're terrified, and then we argue, right? Zechariah the priest. This is um, part of the story that Sandy just read about Elizabeth. This is, this one, man, this is terrible. This is in Luke 1. This is really the beginning of the Christmas story. When Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all the Lord's commandments and regulations, but they had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. One day, Zechariah was serving in the temple, for his order was on duty. As was the custom of the priests, he was chosen to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. And while the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside. Okay, so he's standing in the part of the old temple where only the priest could go. He's right outside the curtain of the Holy of Holies where, the, where God lived at that time, right? He's on God's front doorstep burning incense. And while Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear, right? Because that's how it goes. The angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayers. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will be a great joy. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth, and he will turn the Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man in the spirit and power of Elijah, and he will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of their fathers back to their children, and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. Zechariah said, how can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man now, and my wife is also well along in years. The angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God Almighty. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. But now, since you did not believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. So, Zechariah, as a priest who was qualified to enter the temple of God, he would have known the story of Abraham, right? Every Hebrew at that time would have known the story of Abraham, how Abraham was 100 years old and he had a son because God sent an angel to tell Abraham and Sarah that they would have a son. He would have known that story. He would have known that God had done this before. He also would have recognized this sentence, he will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord and will turn the hearts of their fathers back to the children. See, because at this time, 
God had been silent for 400 years. And the very last book of the Old Testament in Malachi, it ends with this word. I am sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. His preaching will turn the hearts of their fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Right? I mean, the angel's basically quoting the last thing that God told his people before he went silent. And Zechariah would have known that. I mean, now, can you imagine if you're Gabriel, right? I mean, God Almighty, creator of the universe, is you stand to the right hand of God. And when God has something important to do, he tells you to go do it, right? And you come to Zechariah, who's supposed to know all this stuff, and you give him this announcement, and Zechariah's like, man, I'm not buying it. I mean, how frustrating would that be, right? I mean, it would be like Godzilla arguing with a flea. I mean, only, only even more so. So anyway, for whatever reason, we tend to get terrified, and then we tend to doubt that this could possibly happen. We just can't wrap our brains around what God wants to do as fast as God wants to do it, I think. So each of these people, we've got Moses and Gideon and Zechariah and Elizabeth and then Mary, each one was chosen for a special role in God's story. So God sent an angel to talk with each of them and to tell them what was going on. Now, you know, this doesn't happen every day. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure I've ever seen an angel, at least not one that I was aware of. I, I never talked to anybody that absolutely, you know, had like an angelic figure appear that was otherworldly and glowing white, you know, 14-foot sword, all that kind of stuff. I've, I've never talked to anybody that had seen that. But even without an angel coming to you to tell you that you have a special role, I'm here to tell you that every person in this room has a role to play in God's story. Every one of you, right? So how do I know this? I mean, it feels good to hear that, right? But if Jim Barrett says it, so what? I mean, who's Jim Barrett, right? I know this because God tells us this in his scriptures. In 1 Corinthians, it says, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. So that doesn't leave anybody out, right? Every single person is somebody that God is prepared to work through, right? <clears throat> Let me give you an example of, of how weird this is, right? I walked in this morning, and Sandy and I are sitting here singing, and I look over, and I see Lindsay sitting here. Lindsay, would you stand up and show the folks your shirt? I have a story, right? 24 hours ago, Lindsay didn't even own that shirt. Her cousin gave it to her yesterday. That's why she wore it today, right? Isn't that weird? I would be up here to talk about how God has a part in his story for everybody, and Lindsay's wearing a shirt that's just reminding us that God wrote this story, right? That's the level of care that God has for you in this story, right? Before the world began, before Genesis started, before any of that happened, God said, someday in 2018, there's going to be a guy named Corey Bowling and he's going to show up on Xenia Avenue, and here's the story that I have written for him, right? And then that is, I mean, it's true for Corey, but it's true for every one of us, that God has written a part in his story for each one of us. Now, Mary, from what we know, didn't appear to be anybody special. She's a young girl from Nazareth. Now, Nazareth is sort of a backwater in, uh, you know, it's maybe not the best part of the country. It's not the capital. It's in the north on the other side of Samaria where the important people didn't ever go. And um, when Jesus is recruiting disciples, it says that Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and whom the prophets wrote. So we have found the Messiah, he's saying. It's Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel comes back and says, Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? <laughs> right? So God didn't pick somebody in the capital city. God picked somebody from the wrong side of the tracks. Right. Now, there's, 
There's no doubt that God takes delight in choosing unlikely people to do his work, right? I mean, if God was the coach of a football team and you were three touchdowns behind with five minutes to go, God wouldn't put Tom Brady in as quarterback, right? Because, I mean, well, let's face it. If Tom Brady throws three touchdowns in five minutes, it's like, yeah, well, it's Tom Brady. So God isn't going to do that, right? God probably wouldn't even put me in because he's like, people would say, well, man, I didn't know Jim could throw like that, right? But, I mean, God's going God's gonna to put... God's going to put Abby in, right? Because, because nobody, nobody's going to say that it was Abby's talent that got that done, right? They're going to see, man, that's got to be God. And so that's what we have. That's the kind of God that we're, that we're serving is a God that delights in choosing the most unlikely people because they're unlikely. So... The next thing that I want to say is that every role in God's story matters, even if you don't understand why it matters now. See, often that we don't get to see everything that God's doing when we're acting out part of his story, which is, I think is okay, because I think if God sort of showed us the whole play before we got started, I think that we would be terrified and that we would never get started, right? I see Dick and Marie back here nodding their heads, right? Dick and Marie have been in our small group for the past few years, and one of the first things that I remember Dick saying to me is, man, I hate public speaking. I'm terrified. I I don't want to be a leader. That's not me. And then he took over the Jobs for Life class, and now he started his own small group, and he was up here the other day talking about buying Bibles for for the kids in the neighborhood. I think if Dick and Marie had looked at what God had planned for them, they would have said, I'm not going down that road because that's too scary. Well, you know what? Nobody starts out with the big things. You start with the small things. And you see that God works through the small things. And then you graduate and you go on. So the Bible talks about a lot of people who lived by faith that God would do what he said he was going to do but never actually saw the results. Hebrews 11 is sort of a Hall of Fame chapter of of all the saints in the Old Testament. And it talks about it was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed God when he called him to leave his home. It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child, though she was barren and too old. And then it goes on to say, all these people died still believing what God had promised them, They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it from a distance and welcomed it. See, because they knew that God had a master plan to redeem the world, and they understood that they were a part of it. And so even though they didn't get to see the end of the story, they acted out their part faithfully because that's what God is looking for. 1 Corinthians 15 says, So, my dear brothers and sisters, stand strong. Do not let anything move you and always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your work in the Lord is never wasted. So God gives us that assurance. We may not understand what God is doing in our story, which is his story, but we can guarantee that it's not wasted. And even the things that God maybe wouldn't have wanted us to do that we do, God can make those things work too, right? Let me remind you that there is nothing that you can do and there is nowhere that you can go that disqualifies you from God using you in his story the day you're willing to be a part of it, right? That is absolutely true. So all these saints, you know, Moses and Abraham and Noah, that's a long way back. So let's talk about somebody a little bit closer to home. I want to talk about Lois Tipton for a minute. How many of you remember Lois Tipton? Lois was, and her husband, Tip, I never got to know Tip. He died before Sandy and I moved to the neighborhood. But I did get to know Lois when we moved here. And Lois was a a faithful member of Otterbein Church down the street here when what is New Hope was at Otterbein. And Jeff and I were talking about Lois the other day, and Jeff said, you know, when I first got here, she didn't want to have anything to do with me. (laughs) Who's this lunk from Oklahoma coming in here to fix things? I, you know, we don't need him. But over the years, Lois came to understand God's heart for Jeff and Jeff's heart for God. 
And in the end, he said, there was nothing that Lois wouldn't do if you asked her. When Jeff and Sharon got married, Jeff's parents couldn't be here. And so Lois and Tip volunteered to stand in as his parents for the wedding. I mean, that's pretty cool, right? So the first year that Sandy and I were here, I was leading a Bible study in the morning, and Lois would come, and we would do our, you know, 45-minute or Bible study, whatever. And so often we would end, and Lois would say, I have so much to learn. She'd been a faithful member of the church her whole life. She was the person who was willing to do anything that you ask, and her humble heart reminded her daily, I have so much to learn. So Lois never lived. Lois died a couple years ago. She didn't live to see the beginning of the recovery ministry at New Hope Church, which has become a huge part of what New Hope Church is building, right? Every week, more than 200 times, somebody walks through the door of the coffee bar, and they have the opportunity to find love and acceptance and true love the way God wants us to love. And... In a way, every person that walks through that coffee bar door and finds love and acceptance, they got a lot of people to thank for it, but Lois Tipton is one of them. Isn't that cool? I mean, she had no idea what God was building here on Xenia Avenue, but she was faithful to be a part of building it. Now, I don't know if that's the role that Lois would have chosen for herself. I don't know. But the thing is, most of the time, we don't get to choose the role that we play in God's story. Right? Right? which is probably a good thing, because God made us. He knows things that are inside of us that we don't even have a clue are there. And the things that God wants to bring out are the things that he's given us and the strengths that he's ready to give us for whatever task. And they're, they're probably, like I said earlier, there's probably things that God has planned for us that if we knew about it, we would be scared and we would never take that first step. But 1 Samuel reminds us that God doesn't view things the way men do. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 1 Corinthians 12 reminds us, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. You know, so we don't get to choose the gifts that we have and the talents that we have. I mean, I... Honestly, I wish I had a great singing voice. I really do. I mean, I, I, I don't. You don't want to hear me sing. I have a terrible singing voice. But I love to listen to particularly like men with that deep bass, you know, voice kind of thing. Man, I love that kind of thing. I can't do that. I'm a terrible tenor, whatever. But that isn't the role that God has for me. It's like, okay. So Gideon never saw himself as a great warrior. But that was the role that God had for him. And God said, I'm going to do this through you. Moses never thought of himself as being a great speaker, right? But that's the role that God had for him. Mary probably never imagined that she would be the mother of the Messiah. But that's the role that God had for her. Can you imagine what that was like? I mean, how is she going to explain all this to Joseph? Right? So... We don't know exactly how old Mary was, but the, tr- the, the way things worked in those days, she probably would have been 12 to 14 years old because that was the age at which you would be um, betrothed, which is what we think of as engaged, except betrothal was more than engagement because if you broke off a betrothal, it was essentially a divorce. So Mary was betrothed to Joseph, and then she's going to show up pregnant. Well... Number one, everybody in town, I mean, Nazareth wasn't that big a place, right? Everybody in town is going to know what Mary's been doing. And Joseph's going to know it wasn't him, right? I mean, this line when it says, when Mary says, you know, how can this happen? Because I'm a virgin. I mean, that doesn't mean I'm a young girl, right? Everybody knew how the birds and the bees worked, right? She understood that. So this is going to be a problem for her relationship with her future husband. Right? Probably, and matter of fact, the Bible even tells us that Joseph planned to send her away. Right? So, not only is this possibly going to cost her her husband, listen to what it says in Deuteronomy. 
If a virgin is engaged to a man and another man meets her in the city and goes to bed with her, you must bring the two of them to the gate of that city and stone them to death. Because that was the penalty for messing around before you were married. So how many people are going to believe Mary when she says, um, actually, it was the Holy Spirit. There was an angel and he appeared. Right, right? But she had faith that if God was going to do this thing, God was somehow going to make it all right. So don't go thinking that just because God was blessing Mary that he was making life easy for her. If anything, he was making life a whole lot harder for her, right? One of the scriptures tells Mary, the prophet Simeon tells her that, that her child will be blessed and that she will be blessed and that a sword will pierce your soul. I mean, gosh, who wants that part of it, right? So Mary's role not only changed everything about her life, and put her in mortal danger. But look at her reaction to this. She doesn't argue, as almost everybody else in the Bible does. What does she say? She says, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. Wow. So this is undoubtedly not the role that Mary would have chosen for herself. But when God revealed this is your role, she said, I'm a servant of the Lord. Bring it on. I'm ready. We do, not, we do usually get to decide how big of a role we're going to play in God's story. See, you may not get the part that you thought you should have, but whether you have a small part in God's story or a big part in God's story is pretty much up to you, I think. Because God has great things for all of us planned. But if we're unwilling to do them, if we're unwilling to trust, God is probably going to go and find someone else to make that part of the story. And then who misses out? We do. Right. We miss out on the opportunity to be a part of the cool thing that God is doing. So just like an athlete probably doesn't start their career in the Super Bowl, we probably are not going to start serving God with some unbelievable huge thing like like leading the people to freedom or or you know whatever because there's all kinds of scriptures that talk about how being faithful in small things leads to being faithful in bigger things so at one time Jesus told a parable of some servants who had been left in charge of some money while their master was away and when the master returns, some of the servants have been hard at work and some of them haven't. And one of the ones that hadn't been hard at work, the master said, turning to the other standing nearby, the king ordered, take this pound of gold from this servant and give it to the one who has 10 pounds. But master, they said, he already has 10 pounds, right? Parentheses, that's not fair. Yes, the king replied, and to those who use well what they're given, even more will be given. But to those who do nothing with what they have, even what little they have will be taken away. Last week, Jeff talked about living generously, and he talked about the widow in the temple. God didn't measure the money that was going into the offering box by the amount of dollars and cents. Jeff reminded us that the two pennies that the widow put in were more valuable to God than all the bags of gold that the rich people put in because it was everything that the widow had. And she was saying, God, I trust you completely. Here's, here's all of me. Here's everything I have. I trust you. So, are you ready for the role that God has written for you? I don't know. It's kind of a scary thought sometimes. Particularly when we think, I don't know what the role is, right? I mean... I, was talking with a friend a couple weeks ago, and he says, man, if only an angel would come and tell me what I'm supposed to be doing, I think I'd do it. You know, that's probably not how things are going to start off. So in the absence of special instructions from an angel, what do we do? I think what we do is we go to the Bible, and we follow the basic rules that are written out for everybody that's playing on the team. And those rules are what? Love God and love other people right? Those are the basics. Number one, love God. Number two, love others. 
And if we're doing those things faithfully, that signals to God that we're somebody that are, he's ready to, that are ready to work with him. So many of the people that are recorded as seeing angels in the Bible are already obeying the instructions that they have from God. Listen to what, what I read earlier from Zechariah and Elizabeth. The Bible says that both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all of the Lord's commandments and decrees blamelessly. Well, I think most of us would agree that that's not us, right? In, the, in Acts, there's a Roman soldier named Cornelius, who was a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. And the Bible says that he and his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generous to those in, generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at a three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. And Cornelius stared at him in fear and then said, what is it, Lord? The angel said, your prayers and your gifts to the poor have come up as an offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter right? Cornelius didn't know everything. He wasn't even one of the chosen Hebrews, but he was faithful with what he had. He was faithful with what he knew. So he was generous to others. He was loving others, and he prayed regularly to God. He was loving God, right? So knowing that God has written a part of his story just for me gives me incredible joy right? What did Mary say in response to this? In, in, um, she said that my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he took notice of his lowly servant girl, right? And it, I mean, it should be really reassuring that not only that God notices us, that God knows about us, but that God planned us before the beginning of time. I mean, how special is that, Right? That feels pretty special to know that God had all of this planned out. So Mary responded with joy. Now, joy is different than happiness, right? Happiness has to do with our immediate circumstances. I'm walking down the street and I find a $5 bill and there's nobody around. I'm happy, right? <laughs> Wendy's value meal, here I come, right? But that doesn't make me joyful way down deep in my heart because once that, once that five bucks is gone, I'm still the same person I was. I'm in the same situation I was, right? Joy comes from an unshakable security. And that the only unshakable security that there is in this life is that God wrote a part in his story for you and he loves you like crazy and he's just waiting for you to let him act out that part through you. I mean, that's the only security there is in this life. I, I think many of you know that Sandy and I live down the street in a building that we spent four years renovating. And a week ago Saturday, a car came flying up Xenia Avenue and hit a telephone pole and ended up about three feet from our building. And I got to looking at the trajectory that this car had taken. And if that car had been about four feet to the right, that car would have gone through the front corner of our building where the arch holds all the weight of the facade, the whole front half of our house would have collapsed. You know, you put your security in things of this world, they are going to let you down. The only security comes from knowing that God has a part planned just for me. I would have been unhappy, right? but I would have still had something to hold on to for joy. You see, joy is the power that can set us free from ourselves. And you know, we're all slaves to ourselves. That's how we're born, right? And that's basically original sin, is that we're slave to ourselves. But Philippians says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. You know, you can't do that on your own. I'm not even sure you can fake that on your own very well. In Matthew chapter 20, Jesus called his disciples together and he said, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people 
and, and officials flaunt their authority over those who are under them. But among you, it's going to be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man, that's Jesus' title for himself, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and give his life as a ransom for many. And so if, if Jesus, who was equal with God, is willing to leave heaven and come down and be a human, I mean, how humiliating for us, Shouldn't the knowledge of that and the knowledge of how special we are set us free from this prison we're in to ourselves? And set us free from that effort of always promoting ourselves? And, you know, most of the time that's what we do. I, I heard a thing on the radio a couple years ago about a guy that went into a coffee shop and put a sign on the table and it said, I'll buy you a cup of coffee if I can tell you my story. Here we are, we're back to the story, right? He stayed there for three hours and not one person took him up on that offer. The next day he went into the same coffee shop and he put up a sign that had said, I will listen to your story if you'll buy me a cup of coffee. And people were waiting in line for that, right? Because we're all addicted to our own story and we all want someone to listen. So... What can you give somebody for Christmas, right? I don't know. Maybe you don't have any money to buy anything. You've probably got ears to listen. It's just an idea. But so often we get this wrong. We think we're doing great, and then we're not. I have this ornament that I put on our tree every year. Sandy and I were decorating our tree yesterday, and I got this out, and I thought, man, i got to talk about this, because this is like the worst Christmas story ever right here. Some of you have probably heard this story. The first year that Sandy and I moved to the neighborhood, we were living in a great little house over here on Dover Street. And this was a picture I took of our front porch after I put up the icicle lights and we had these two lighted wreaths and there were two posts on our porch. And so I put little nails up there, you know, because you don't want to make big holes in your house. And I, and I hung the wreaths up there and I got the wires just so and I plugged them in. And about a week later, I came home one day, and one of the wreaths was not on the post where I'd left it. And I thought, well, maybe it fell down. You know, it was kind of windy last night, so I parked my truck, and I got out, and I'm looking in the bushes, and look, it's not there. It's like, rats. Somebody stole it. So, so I go in, and I eat lunch, and then I'm driving up Dover Street. And two blocks up on the front gate of this house is my wreath. And I like, pull the truck over. And I went over to look at the wreath. And it's like, sure enough, those zip ties that I used to put the bow on, it's the same zip ties. Th this, there's no doubt about it. This is my wreath. And they had taken some coat hanger and wired it to the front gate. It, it actually looked kind of pretty. So I did a U-turn, and I went back to the house. And I went down to the basement, and I got my wire cutters. And I walked up to that street, and I, you, man, if there was a camera, there would have been smoke rolling off of my head. I was so angry. And I went up to the house, and I cut the, the, uh, the wreath off the gate, and I started walking away, and I heard a door open behind me, and a woman said, Don't steal my wreath! And I turned around, and there was a woman standing in the door. I had seen her around the neighborhood, particularly I'd, I'd seen her down here at the apartments where the dope boys hang out. But I was, I was angry, and I said, this is my wreath. It's stolen off of my porch. No, it's not. My son brought me that yesterday, blah, blah, blah. I took that wreath, and I walked away. And I went back to my house, and I got out some big screws and some metal straps. And man, at this point, I didn't care what kind of holes were in my house. I screwed that sucker to the porch. I'm kind of surprised it's not still there, right? Man. Man took care of that problem. Nobody's going to diss me like that, right? So the next morning, I get up, and I pull out my bulletin and pull out Digging Deeper. And the verse for the day is from Luke 6. It says, to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, offer them your other cheek. And if someone demands your coat, 
give them your other shirt also. Give to anyone who asks, and when things are taken from you, don't try to get them back. <laughs> because if you love only those who love you, what credit should you get for that? Even sinners love those who love them. When I was walking back down Dover Street with my wreath, triumphantly with my wire cutters, what do you, th what, what do you think the expression on God's face watching is that? A 10-year-old, $8, stupid, plastic wreath, right? You think that this woman probably remembers that? What would have happened? You know, people that don't normally go to church go to church around Christmas, right? What would have happened if the next week she walked in the door and I was standing there to greet her? You think she'd have been open to hearing about loving others the way that God loves us? No. I, my pride completely terminated any chance I had of being a witness for God to that woman. And that house, a couple days later I was driving by, the front window was cracked out. It had a plastic tarp up there with duct tape on it. And it's like, this is the crappiest house in the neighborhood. And this woman is living in here, and the only thing she's probably going to get for Christmas is this stolen wreath that her son gave her, yes. right? And I took away that gift because I accused her son of stealing it. Yeah. So I have this ornament that I put up at Christmas every year to remind myself of those things that I haven't given over to God yet because... Those things are a huge stumbling block yeah. to what we can do in playing out the story that God has for us. Instead, what we ha should have is the security and the joy that knowing that God has written a part for us. And we should be able to say, that reef, it doesn't matter. An hour of my time, it doesn't matter. Money to buy somebody lunch, it doesn't matter. I have the unshakable security of knowing that God wrote a part for me in his story and that he is working on me to build something great. And somehow my own refusing to get over myself gets in the way of that. So I would invite you this Christmas season to think about the ways that you might be able to bless somebody else by listening to their story, by paying attention to someone who doesn't get enough attention. There's all kinds of free things that we can do to build somebody else up, to count somebody else as more important to ourselves. And God, in his love, has set us free to be able to listen to someone else's story instead of spending all of our time promoting ourselves.